Well, good morning, brothers and sisters and young people. Today we're looking at the city of Jerusalem, or the daughter of Zion, as it is here on the screen, which, of course, in itself goes right the way back many, many years. It is a city that is spoken of in the Psalms where our God tells us that Yahweh hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. He says, this is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. And the interesting thing about Jerusalem is, is all the different talk that you hear, especially in the media today, especially amongst um, the more, I'm going to say, Arab-inspired media, and that is the fact that many people claim that there was no kingdom of Israel, there was no King David, there was no temple even, um, that that's all just fanciful things of the past. And um, when we come to then look at this, it becomes imperative that we're, we're able to sort of know for certainty that these things, in fact, were so. So we'd like to start way at the beginning, where we sort of began yesterday with Abraham. Abraham came, of course, from the Battle of the Kings, uh, back in Genesis, chapter 14, and verse 18, that we read that Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So that was uh, Genesis 14, verse 18. We looked at Abraham going in the Battle of the Kings and the Valley of Siddim and all the things that went on, and he returned to the city of Salem. And um, Melchizedek, and this, this character comes out. He is both king and priest. And, of course, we're told in uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And that's the priesthood that we will belong to as well. Because remember what it says in the book of Revelation, where we read there that um, he will make us kings and priests, and we will reign uh, with our God. And so this is the city that Abraham came back to, and it goes right the way back to, to very, very early times, and, um, of course, it was here that Abraham would come later on in Genesis chapter 22, where we read in verse 1, It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains that I will tell thee of. So this is a... Uh, a drawing of the area. The Kidron Valley runs down here. The Central Valley is here. The Valley of the Son of Hinnom. So this is way before Jerusalem itself um, that we know of in, in sort of more modern Old Testament times. Mount Moriah itself is, is right there on, on the uh, sort of center of everything. And the eastern hill is where the original Jebusite city would have been that um, Melchizedek would have been uh, king over. And Abraham comes up into this area and he offers his son, Isaac, on the mountain, the specific mountain that God says he would tell him of. So when you look back to that time period and you say, well, is there any evidence of Jerusalem from the time of Abraham back in Genesis and um, the time of the Jebusites, as they are originally called? And um, there is, in fact, quite a substantial amount of evidence. It's the city of Jebus, as it was originally uh, became known anyway. Salem or Jebus is one of the same things. And remember we read about this yesterday when we looked at the, the kings that came in a confederacy against Joshua. And it was just over in Joshua chapter 10, and we're just kind of grabbing some of those same strands together. We read there in Joshua chapter 10 and verse 1, that it came to pass that Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai, and utterly destroyed it, and Jericho, and so on and so forth, that he gathers all those kings, that confederacy of kings, against it. And it's interesting, you notice his name. He's Adonai Zedek, whereas the last one we're told about is Melchizedek, the king of Salem. This is Lord of Salem. Or this is Lord of, of Zedek, or, or righteousness in that sense. Or, so you sort of see this sort of a bit of a dynastic name that's tied into this. But this is the city of Jebus. And um, when you go down Hezekiah's... Um, tunnel. Uh, there's a great big painting on the wall, and this is the reconstruction painting of what they believe the city of Jebus would have looked like. And this, of course, is a, a picture of what it would have looked like around the time of David coming forward a few years. 
Uh, we read in, in 1 Chronicles 11, verses 4 to 5, David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jeba. So we're told there it's one and the same thing, where the Jebusites were, the inhabitants of the land, and the inhabitants of Jeba said to David, Thou shalt not come hither. Nevertheless, David took the castle of Zion, which is the city of David. So you kind of, kind of have some equivalents that are made there for us. So when we're talking about Jebus, it is the same city as Jerusalem, which is the same city of David, called the city of David, also called Zion. All of those things are synonymous terms that are used throughout the history of the Bible um, with the city. And of course, David took it. The Jebusites said, look, you know, even the lame and the blind won't be able to, or will be able to overcome you because this city is such an impregnable stronghold. It always amuses me when a man does that. When he talks about his impregnable cities, like the city of Babylon, that just couldn't be taken, and yet it was taken in the night. He builds great big ships that are unsinkable, like the Titanic. Not. You know, it's just that's the way man is. He's, his arrogance is such a way. And here the people of, of Jebus are extremely arrogant to David. Um, but nevertheless, David comes along and he takes it. Well, when you go down um, under the city, this is well underground because there's many, many thousands of years and much dirt and soil has been piled up over the years, burying the original structures. But they've dug right down to the base of what was this, uh, this great fortress. So you can see the fortress there, you see the big stones. Well, these are those stones, and this is an archeologist, and you can see the size of the stones at the bottom of, this is one of the towers. So this is the foot of the tower that you can see basically here, and here he is standing next to it. So it's a, it's a massive complex and a huge structure, but this is down multiple stories underground. We went down and down and down, and stairs after stairs after stairs to get down to this place, and uh, it's buried deep under the city. In fact, these great big structures here, these steel structures hold above it, um, the city itself is, is up there somewhere, several floors up. So it's right down the bottom is this old, old uh, Jebusite fortress. But of course the fortress was taken by David. Uh, the story of, um, of Joab going up the water shaft, and for many years people thought it was what they called Warren Shaft. And they just very recently found a whole other water course. It was a Jebusite water course. And um, it's uh, right in the city as well. It's the one they believe now that, that uh, Jerobo, or, um, Joab actually went up. Because the one that they say is the one that he went up was actually well covered on the ground um, in the time that he would have been there. So um, all these things are just coming to light right at this time. So then you come to what becomes the city of David. Because once it was taken, of course, that's what it was named. It was named the city of David. And just to kind of get an idea, this is from my brother Lane's drawings. And um, this kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like. And one of the things Lane was very helpful with us was, you know, some of us are a bit directionally challenged. It runs in my family. I don't think my dad can find his way out of a paper bag pretty much. But like trying to sort of just triangulate, I guess coming from British Columbia, I find it really difficult when there's no mountains. I mean, look over there and I can see Mount Robson. I know where I am. I know which direction that is and you can sort of figure out where you are. So it's sort of the same thing in Israel because it's all new. Um, but right away, you sort of have the, the north, south, east, and the west of the city. The north is up here, um, over to the east, and then south and west. And of course, the mountains, Mount Moriah is up in the north. And you have the Mount of Olives, which you can't quite see. It's just off the screen. The Mount of Offense, which is where Solomon built all those uh, idols and uh, the, uh, the different um, cultic sites for his wives. The Mount of Evil Council, named such because that's where, I'm going to say more mythology says, that Judas struck the deal with the high priest. Incidentally, it's where the United Nations had their headquarters, which is kind of ironic. Um, the Kidron Valley that runs right down this side. The Valley of Hinnon, which is the bottom one. And then the central valley that runs down this side. So in David's time, this was the extent of the city. And um, the Gihon Spring sits out here. And um, you've got the actual city of David. And then the palace of David is the structure that sits right there. So this is a, a bit of an artist's rendition or a rebuild of this, just to kind of give you a concept of what it would have looked like.
that's the Jebusite Tower we were talking about. If you go to the City of David and do the tour, this is the one part of the video that they actually play for you. So this would be David's palace um, that they believe sat at the top of that structured hill that we'll look at in just a moment. And um, all of this, of course, these stones that you're seeing would have been covered in a plaster. They wouldn't have been uh, quite the rock that you see there. They would have been plastered over, so it would have been like a white city sitting on a hill. That just gives you a little bit of a concept of what that city would have looked like um, in David's day. Now this of course is before the temple has been built on the northern hill of Moriah, which it would have been the threshing floor of Horn and the Jebusite. So this is the structure of David's palace here. Um, we're just going to take a look at that in a moment. Up at the top is where they've actually found the palace of David. And uh, this is looking down on the city of David. This is inside the, the palace structure itself. So the excavations began really in this area in 1967 because before that time period, um, Israel was not in control of this area. They didn't have um, the, the West Bank or the city of Jerusalem. They had a small portion of it, but most of it was cut off from, uh, from access. So in 1967, once the Temple Mount and this whole area was, was freed up, then excavations were able to begin. And Brother Lane was there at the time, he was not a Christadelphian back then. He actually ran into a Christadelphian in Israel, living on a kibbutz, and that's where he learned the truth. Um, but this is, uh, this is their original excavations that began back in the, the late 60s, and they uncovered this, this wall, which is a terraced wall, um, and it's described for us in Chronicles, in 1 Chronicles 11. David dwelt in the castle, therefore they called it the city of David. And he built the city round about, even from Milo round about, and Joab repaired the rest of the city. So David waxed greater and greater, for Yahweh of hosts was with him. So this is the, the city of David, and Brother Lane is going to explain it to us. Earliest remains is Jebusite. Jerusalem was first fortified as a city with city walls, and on the northern end, which is here, is the end of the northern of Jerusalem in the up to the time of King David. Yes, they built a big fortress here. These walls with the smaller stones down below, and the one here down below us here, date back to the Jebusite period. They're 3,850 years old. They built here on the rock terrace walls, filled them in on the inside. They're not rooms, they're the solid terraces to support a building higher up, a Canaanite fortress, and that was conquered by King David. Those terraces got destroyed a little bit, but on top of it, to make it smooth, he built this stepped stone structure. You see the stones coming down, stepping all the way down here to here down below? So he covered his mantle over the Jebusite remains, and on top he built a palace. So what you see here in different colors, the Jebusite remains down below here, but those little walls on top there, they are also Jebusite. So this and this, we you know, is Jebusite. Then King David built, oh, and that was there to support a, um, a fortress palace on top. King David built the palace in the same place and supported it with this stone mantle, the stepped stone structure, and that continued all the way around here, we think, to support the palace on top. So in the time of David, we believe it looks something like this. So here was the original mountainside, a uh, big bastion here, and a palace on top. I made this drawing in 1995, and 10 years later they found this wall of David's palace. Okay, so that is more or less what the palace would have looked like in the time of King David. But then, then King Hezekiah came, the city expanded to the west, and new city walls to the, all the way down to the <coughs> bottom, this lost its strategic value. There was an enormous pressure on building ground, people need to build houses. So here there's those four pillars, two standing up complete and two stubby ones, uh, that was 
a house built here in the time of King Hezekiah. Very well organized house, uh, steps going up, you can see them there on the very, very left hand side, come in the living room, there was once a little door at the back to go to the loo. Oh, that's the toilet. See the stone there lying on that side? Mm. That's all anatomically correct. You will squat on the toilet, as you do still do in many Mediterranean countries here, including Israel. And and then there's the burnt room here on the other side, that is this house here. So it's all chock a buck full of houses, just like it is on the other side of the of the valley. So that's the structure there, and that's the uh, the... In this area, they found what's called a bula, which is this little stone here, it's a little seal, and um, dates from the time of Hezekiah, and it actually has the name of Beit Lechem on it, Bethlehem. And see, the problem is, is a lot of critics have said, well, there's, you know, there's no city of Bethlehem, there's no evidence of any of these things existing, because back in those days, they didn't have a big sign, you know, Bethlehem, population 6,000 or whatever. Um, they didn't have anything like that at all. I mean, you come to the city of Bethlehem, and that's the city of Bethlehem. It's not a big sign that says, welcome to Sodom or welcome to Bethlehem. Um, they have to find that from the evidence that's buried there. So, in that place, what's really interesting is the Palace of David being um, discovered. Because a lot of people have said, a lot of critics of the Bible, archaeologists included, have said, well, there's not really any evidence of the man David ever having existed. And it's just in the last few years that they have actually figured out that this is, at the top of here, where David's palace would have been. We have that passage about David building the Milo all the way around and inward. And um, so this is the structure that he was talking about. That's the set stone structure that you see in the video. And uh, this is the palace up on top. Well, the palace remains, as it's been excavated in just the last little while, is uh, available today to go visit. And this is what it looks like. You can walk all the way through, and they've dug right the way down to the floor of the palace. A huge structure, um, a very large palace indeed. But what's so interesting about this is that this is sort of just coming to light right now. When people have said for years, oh, there's no evidence of David, well, all of a sudden, guess what? Here's the palace. And not only that, but in Isaiah chapter 16, as you, you look at the structure and you see, you can see the floor there, the, the, the throne room and, and different things like that. Um, we read there in, in Isaiah 16 verse 1, Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness, unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. And that's a prophecy about the future, talking about this tabernacle or the dwelling place of David. For years they said, there is no such dwelling place, David's a mythological character. Well, now they have dug up the tabernacle of David, the dwelling place. Not that they're going to rebuild this palace, this will be probably eliminated in the earthquake, but the point is, is that they've now found the place where David would have lived. Now just come over, if you would, to Amos chapter 9, because there's another prophecy here about David's tabernacle, and it's, it's fascinating because, again, they've just found this. No different than we looked at Sodom yesterday. In a time period where immorality runs rampant, they dig up the very evidence of God's view and judgment upon it. Well, now they, they dig up this, this palace room, uh, the throne room of David, and um, in this throne room, um, or in this, this palace structure, um, we have this passage kind of superimposed over this. When we read in Amos chapter 9 and verse 11, a prophecy talking about the future, in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof. I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. And of course, this is the place where the Lord Jesus Christ will come. So there's the prophecy saying that there's the ruins of the palace and the tabernacle, the dwelling place of David, but God in the future is going to build this up once again, he's going to raise it up once again, and he's going to reestablish the tabernacle of David. That will happen very shortly. The irony is they're digging up the old tabernacle and the ruins now, which tells us that there's what was, and people said, oh, you know, it's all myths. 
But this is what he says about the future. So the evidence that we've been looking at, the proof that what the Bible has said and the places and the people were true, helps us then have confidence in the prophecy that says, well, in the future, this is what he's going to do. So David, of course, we knew, no, made preparations for the building of the temple that would come shortly thereafter. Um, this is the city of David. Of course, up the top here is Mount Moriah. And, of course, it's the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, because there was a Jebusite living in the city of Jebus because that's where they inhabited. Fascinating that this Jebusite, as we read about him in the, in the, in the, the story in Samuel, is a God-fearing man. He's somebody who is very cognizant of what's going on and who offers to give David the threshing floor for the purpose that's been designed. Because that's, of course, where the ark stayed for some period of time. And so uh, we have here in 2 Samuel 24, verse 24, that David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver, and David built there an altar unto Yahweh and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings there. So this was the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, and you can see it there right on the top of the hill. And of course, a threshing floor is on the top of the hill so that when you throw up the wheat and the chaff, the wind, which is usually a little stronger at the top of a hill, will blow all the chaff off, and the corn or the wheat will fall into the, into the ground. So that's where it's strategically located. And of course, that has great import to us when we look at it from a spiritual point of view, of the separation of wheat from chaff. And that's what we're supposed to be doing in our lives, getting rid of the chaff, the stuff that's not important, and, and tossing that out and concentrating on what is important. So David made preparation for Solomon's day to come along. And um, in Solomon's day, we have then, of course, the city that was greatly expanded. There was a lot of building that went on, and of course the temple was part of that. So here's the, uh, the same structure. This is the, the end of the city in David's day, where the palace would have been at the very north of the city. But he built this whole middle section here, and then the temple up to the north. So again, you've got the northeast, southwest, the mountains, Mount of Olives, Mount of Offense, um, and so on, the Kidron Valley, the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, the Central Valley, the Western Hill there. And he built all in the area of the north and built the temple structure up in that area. And when you look at Jerusalem um, and you see all these things, you realize that it's, it's one thing on top of the others. It's expanded. It covers many, many hundreds of years. So David's palace is here in the middle. And then, of course, um, Solomon built the Milo repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father, and then, of course, he built the temple structure. In 2 Chronicles 3, verse 1, someone began to build the house of Yahweh at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where Yahweh appeared to David, his father, in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So this is the very place where all of this structure is put together. And um, it's just fascinating when you look at it, because this is the city today, and there's there's mounds and mounds of things built over top of it all. If you look there on the very far left, that there is David's palace. The Kidron Valley runs down the center here. The temple platform is over here. So that's where the temple itself would be built. This area in David's time didn't exist. The palace structure was the end of the, the, uh, the fortified city. But... You can see here these walls coming down. They're crusader walls. They don't really date anything of biblical significance. Um, but the western wall of the temple platform runs all the way along here. It was built by um, Herod the Great. And um, so this is the, the city that was built by Hezekiah and Solomon, first by Solomon and expanded by Hezekiah. And then David's palace sits down there, down very far to the, the left-hand side of the screen. So when you look at that today... Um, it's hard sometimes to pick it out, but that's the picture that we've got. So just to kind of follow that through visually for a moment, we'll have a look at it. So there is the, the palace structure in the, uh, the far left-hand side where we were standing down here looking up. And you come across here, um, the road goes right the way through it. That's the city built by Solomon. And here's the temple platform that basically is a huge platform. It was expanded by King Herod the Great, much larger than it was in Solomon's time. Um, and uh, it goes all the way out uh, 
uh, along that area. So this is a visualization of it, something he's taken and sort of tried to take the evidence that you have and you put it into a structure, not exactly correct, but it kind of gives you an idea just of the geography as well, of where it would have sat. On top of that, years later, um, Herod the Great built this structure, which we had a lot of uh, information about, and this just gives you an idea of the size of this whole thing. So it's a pretty massive structure um, that was, was built, and um, that's the Capitoline Fortress, or the Antonio Fortress, and um, that's the structure itself. You can see the, the palace, or the court, sorry, and then the court here, the inner court, the court of the Gentiles being up here, and um, this is where the Lord Jesus Christ has done a lot of his teaching. And that was sort of the, the way Jerusalem would have looked at the time, um, more or less, of, of Herod the Great. We're not going to get too much into Herod's uh, building structures. That's, a, that's another class altogether. At this point in time, though, we just want to concentrate on um, Jerusalem itself at the time of Hezekiah and Solomon. So Solomon done all this building. Hezekiah, years later, um, would do even more building because... All of the northern nations, of course, were taken captive. There was an invasion of Israel by the Assyrians, the Gentiles coming to, into the area. And years ago, Brother Ken Stiles and I were taken by Brother John Ramson to uh, the British Museum. And there in the British Museum is the Black Obelisk, which depicts King Jehu from the north, the one who rode his chariot furiously, as he bows down before Shalmaneser III. So this is around 859 to 824 BC, so before Christ, a couple of hundred years before the Babylonian invasion. But this was the beginning of Gentiles coming into this area. It's follow, followed by the story of tiglath pileser So this is a, a hundred or a few years on, around 745 to 727. We have tiglath pileser who came down at the request of Ahab's father to help him fight against Rezin, king of Syria. And of course, that didn't go very well. Rezin was defeated, but they became the servants of uh, tiglath pileser And of course, um, Ahaz had gone to Damascus, and he'd seen this, this really cool-looking altar there, or he thought it was cool, and had the pattern sent back to Jerusalem, and had the high priest build an altar to rival that of the Assyrian Damascus altar. They took the, the labor, they cut it off, the, the oxen that were underneath it, and they moved it, put it on, did some redecorating, put it on a, a, a nice stone floor, and uh, he thought he was making some great uh, additions to the temple. Of course, that was the beginning. You start changing the way um, the worship of Yahweh is supposed to be, and within a few years, the temple itself is shut up. They ended up bringing all kinds of other altars and, and gods into the temple. But within a few years, the whole temple itself is shut up, and it has to wait till the reign of Hezekiah before the thing is actually opened and cleaned up. Of course, when we come to the time of Hezekiah, there was another king, Shalmaneser V of Assyria, uh, 2 Kings chapter 18. Actually, just turn up 2 Kings. We're going to spend a little bit of time in Kings, Chronicles, and Isaiah just as we look at uh, this reign because it's a wonderful, wonderful story of Hezekiah and, and some of the things he does that aren't so good and some of the things that he's done that are really good. But in 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 9, you read it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which is the seventh year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser the fifth king of Assyria came up against Samaria and besieged it. And of course, we know that he took it away. And as the, the rest of the chapter goes on to speak, it's because they obeyed not the voice of Yahweh their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses, the servant of Yahweh, commanded, and would not hear or do what was written in that covenant. And so because of their transgression, God removed them out of the land and their inheritance. And brethren, sisters, young people, the, the Lord Jesus Christ gives a similar warning to the Ecclesiastes. He says, except you repent, I will come and I will remove your lampstand out of its place. Which they would have right away picked up on. It's, it's in the letter to the Ephesians. Because, of course, Titus had come to Jerusalem and had physically removed the lampstand of the nation of Israel and built a great arch in Rome where that lampstand is depicted as being taken away. So that would have resonated with them. 
It's the same thing that God had done to the kingdom in the north. And if we don't get back to what our community is supposed to be about, Bible reading, Bible studying students of the word, then he will remove our lampstands. And we're in danger of that today. As the world gets busier and life just becomes so all-consuming and sports and this and that and the other and work, we get so carried away with it that we lose and we forget what manner of people we're supposed to be. But if we forget our God and we don't listen to his voice, then exactly what happened to the kingdom of the north and eventually the kingdom of the south will also happen to us. Well, a guy named Sargon was co-regent with Shalmaneser the fifth in uh, 722 BC and he reigned around 705. He actually is the one who claims the victory and this is him depicted here. You can always tell the kings, by the way, they're the ones with the sand buckets on their heads. Um, they have the, the bigger hat. So the idea is, you know, whoever's got the tallest hat wins, right? So he's the king with the guy with the little, I don't know if it's an ice cream cone on top of that or whatever it is, but he's the king. So this is Sargon, and this is a, 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 a depiction of him. And it's Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1, that we read, In the year that Tartan came to Ashtod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him and fought against Ashtod and took him. So this is Sargon. This is a, an archaeological discovery where he is depicted. And his great victory over Israel in the north is recorded. And if you want to see it, you have to go to Chicago. Because it was the Oriental Institute in Chicago, the university there, that sort of modeled what the British did and what the French did and the, and the Germans did. They went and they dug up a place called Korsabad um, in what is today sort of Iran, Iraq area. And um, doing what the British did, they just robbed everything and took it. So in Chicago, if you're ever in Chicago, um, I would highly recommend going to this museum. It's only small. Um, we actually found it because we were looking for years ago a picture of Babylon. You know the picture where you see the Ishtar Gate? It's a painting that's been done. And I was trying to find a, an original of that to make a bigger slide of it. And so I was looking through many different sites trying to find this. And we actually saw it on the wall of this museum. As I was, it was kind of one of the 3D virtual tours first came out. And the museum would spin. And there on the wall was a photo or a painting that I was looking for. So I wrote to the curator of the museum, and I told him the absolute truth. I was lecturing at Shippensburg University, and I wanted a copy of this. Of course, if you're lecturing at Shippensburg, I didn't tell him it was Bible school. Um, so he sent me quite happily a copy of the slide. So years later, just a few years back, Shafe and my son and I went there. This is the winged bull. This is the size of it. You can see, he's five foot eight, I think. Size is almost taller than him, but there he is standing by this winged bull, and the inscription is right in here. And it tells the story of how Sargon took um, Israel. And this was his, his great celebration of this, this great um, victory. So when we come to Daniel 2, the Assyrio-Babylonian Empire, remember in Daniel 7, it depicts the lion with the wings at first, and then the wings are plucked up and it stands as a man, right? Well, here you have the creature with the wings here. And it's the beginning of that whole Daniel's image. Well, this would go on a few more years, and then you would have the invasion of Judah by the Assyrians in Hezekiah's day. So he took the north, first of all. His successor then comes down to take the south. And again, people for many years said there's no evidence of Hezekiah, of Ahaz. It's all a bunch of fairy tales and myths. Till the archaeologists start digging, and especially around that area of the city of David, and they've come up with some of these evidences. And so here you have some of the evidence from the dust, a seal of Ahaz, son of Jehotam, king of Judah. So there is his seal right there. And they've dug it up, and they can read the inscription, and it's the sing uh, the um, seal of Ahaz, son of Jotham, as we would call him, but Jotham. And... Uh, then, of course, you've got also the seals of Hezekiah. There are tons of these. Seal of Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah. A whole bunch of different seals of the king Hezekiah, mentioning him by name. So, again, the critics are kind of silenced, but it doesn't stop them. You know, now they just say that there was no kingdom of Israel. There wasn't even a temple. You know, so it's kind of funny because, like, does that mean that Titus made it all up? 
and the Romans. Like there wasn't actually uh, a great victory in Jerusalem that he was just sort of dreaming. And so he made, he made that arch in Rome that somehow that isn't real. You, you know, you wonder where they come up with this stuff. But anyway, um, here is another interesting thing that they found. Um, look at Isaiah 22, verse 15. We read about Shebaniah. Well, here is the tomb of Shebna, um, or Shebaniah, the royal steward. And the little inscription says, there's no silver or gold here, only his bones and the bones of his maidservant with him. Cursed be the man who opens this. Well, obviously that's like, open me and see what's inside, because that's exactly what they did. But they found this inscription that mentions another character, the scribe of Jeremiah's day um, in the Bible. So these are the different things that you see. So in Hezekiah's day, this is the original city here. Solomon built the temple platform here. But you have to kind of put this into perspective. The northern kingdom has been invaded. So all the refugees from the north have come into the south. Not only that, but the entire kingdom of Israel has been taken at this point in time, or, or Judah. There's one city left. When we read about the siege of Hezekiah, there's only one city left, and that's the city of Jerusalem. And so all these people came flocking to the city of Jerusalem. It just must have been packed to the walls. And so they, they took the city wall and they built it all the way around here to, to cover off what is now the western hill. So that's the uh, original city of David, his palace, Solomon's addition, a temple here. They built another palace there. And then you've got the eastern hill with the western hill, which is what Hezekiah included to cover all of this area. And of course, it was in his day that we had this great king Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, who came down. In 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 13, we read there about this king Sennacherib. By the way, the next king didn't like Sennacherib very much, so he scratched his face off. Right? That's quite often what they would do. Uh, different meaning than we have face off here for you know Canadians. It means something entirely different. Back then it means I hate you and uh, we want to get rid of you. So, But they would do all these drawings on the walls. Most of the people were illiterate, so this is sort of like the graphic novel of the day. They literally, these are from the walls of the palace in Nineveh. It's actually, if you want to see it, you've got to go to the British Museum now, because um, they, again, um, took it all, and it now sits in the British Museum. But they, they took these, and they depicted this whole siege um, by, by the, uh, the graphics upon the wall. There's a little bit of writing there, the cuneiform. But we read there in 2 Kings 18, verse 13, it's the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fenced cities of Judah, and he took them. And the whole thing is depicted on this, this great um, uh, graphic novel, really, I don't know what else to call it, this, this uh, depiction that was on the walls of the palace. There's also something called Taylor's Prison, which is really Sennacherib's prison here. Uh, so Sennacherib's prison, this is what it says. Hezekiah, himself like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. I threw up earthworks against him, the one coming out of the city gate, I turned back to his misery. His cities which I had despoiled, I cut off, and he lists a bunch of them he took. He says, I added to the former tribute and laid upon him the surrender of their lands and imposts, gifts for my majesty. Well, that's what he wrote. But this is what the Bible reports. And note the similarities. So this is 2 Kings 18, verse 14. Hezekiah, the king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I've offended, because remember he rebelled against him, uh, return from me, that thou puttest on me I will bear. So the king of Assyria appointed to Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold, and he gave him all the treasury from the Lord's house and from his own house and his own treasuries into the hand of the king of Assyria. And so this was what is recorded in the Bible. And you see the two things are very, very similar. Hezekiah's record and Sennacherib's record, the two histories are very, very similar. Now sometimes, brothers and sisters and young people, we, we read the story of Hezekiah in Jerusalem and we think, you know, come on, he just needed to have more faith. And why was he giving gold and silver and stuff to this guy? You know, it's very easy for us to sit back, armchair warriors, and, you know, thousands of years into the future, knowing the end of the story, and, you know, be kind of smug in our judgment of him. And we do that a lot with Bible characters. Like, we weren't there. If that was us, how would we behave? Um, 
But just consider the siege. Because depicted on the walls um, of Lachish, or of Nineveh, is the siege of Lachish. Now, you might have to squint a little bit here, but you've heard of ISIS, right? One of the things they love to do is remove heads. Well, here are the soldiers, and they have a pile of heads, because that's how they figured out how many of the enemy they had taken out. They would make these piles of heads and skulls. So we're not talking about a friendly sort of occupation force here. So we read that in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 9, after this did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, send his servants to Jerusalem. He himself is laying siege to Lachish, and all his powers with him. So the rest of them go to Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Israel that were at Jerusalem. So the siege of Lachish is recorded in the Bible, and it's all on the walls of the palace in Nineveh. So this is the siege of Lachish, one of Hezekiah's cities. Remember, this is one of the cities that Joshua actually took, we looked at yesterday. So it's been inhabited by Israelites for years and years and years, but now it's being laid siege. And it's, it's a pretty gruesome thing, depicted upon the walls of the city of Nineveh. So you've got here that the siege that takes place. Here's all the archers that are here shooting up at the city. And then there's, there's spearmen and slingers of slings down here. And um, you've got them laying siege. You can just see over here, it's a little dark, but there is the, uh, the, the siege towers and the, um, the ladders that they throw up against this place. And uh, the engines, the siege engines, there's a the siege engine here, which is like our catapults and ramparts and whatever else they would bring. You can see the guys going up the ladders here, depicted in the way they did way back then. Kind of looks like kids' drawings, but that's how they would do it. And um, they took the inhabitants captive. And you can notice here, there's two little children sitting on this chariot that are being taken captive. And everybody here, they're all in chains. And uh, you've got children here and women and whatever else, little kids. They're all being taken captive. How they would do that is they would put a hook through your nose. So nose piercings were in back then. And they'd put a hook through their nose, tie it to a chain. That pretty much made sure that you kept up with everybody else, because if you didn't, you'd pull your nose up. So that was how they, they did this. It's a horrible, horrible people. And uh, it gets worse than that. Here's two guys here being skinned alive. That's the kind of people the Assyrians were. And all the people here are being brought, and there's bodies left, right, and center, and other piles of heads. And all the people are being brought here before Sennacherib, and you can see his chariot down here, as they are brought in subjection to him. So when you think of Hezekiah laid up in this city where they've laid siege against him, this is the fate that awaits him if God does not deliver them. So when we are judgmental of him, we've got to remember this. Skinned alive, head cut off, children having rings put through their noses and led behind chariots and whatever else. That's a pretty scary thing. Not only that, but you've got to figure at this point in time, all of the cities of Judah have fallen. There's only one that's left. Jerusalem. That's it. The entire population has been brought under the boot of the king of Assyria. And sometimes we kind of gloss over those details. That's what Hezekiah is dealing with. It's very, very real. So what he does is he tries to strengthen himself. 2 Chronicles 32, verse 5 he strengthened himself, built up the wall that was broken, raised it up to the towers, and another wall went out, repaired the Milo in the city of David. He made darts and shields in abundance. So he prepared for this day. And he also built a wall and a dam to dam up the city. And Brother Lane's going to tell us about that. Here's the end of the valley, and used to flow straight into the Kidron Valley. That's the Kidron right there in front of us. But in the western hill, is rise up oh, about 30 meters from here. So the Damascus Gate, you understand the Damascus Gate? That is the beginning of the central valley which runs down on the western side of the Temple Mount in between the eastern hill, that's the eastern hill, and the western hill. And King Hezekiah included the western hill into the city. He had to build a city wall right across the end of the western, uh, the central valley. And then this does fill up this water after he had built this channel. 
So this became a massive water reservoir as well. In Herod's time, because people came here to get water, especially the pilgrims, they, he created a big stepped pool, the steps still go down, and here they came to fetch their water, and from here they walked back up to the Temple Mount. Yeah? But before that, it was already a stepped pool, but this plaster step. And Herod the Great built this beautiful stone step here. But that city wall that is buried under the road there was first built by King Hezekiah, strengthened in the Hellenistic period, and still in use because it's both a dam and a city wall closing off the central valley which runs in between the eastern hill there and the western hill there. Hezekiah. Now he built a wall around the western hill which he excavated around here. This is a so-called broad wall. It was much higher as you can see the, the ground went up on at least the level he's standing on, and probably even higher, as you can see, they're eight meters high. The estimated height of the wall, perhaps on the front of it. Hmm. If you look at the map across the wall there, you can see that, see where the city of David is? And the Temple Mount, and then this to Western Hill, and that thick red line is the broad wall. Now, this is mentioned in our archaeological chapter of the time of King Hezekiah, which is chapter 22. And it says, and here the prophet is speaking against Hezekiah. So you have seen also the breaches of the city of David, that there are many. And we had to repair the millow, but the indoors come around to doing it. You get it together, the waters of the lower pool. We walked through the channel that brought the water of the Gile Spring to the lower pool. And then it says, you have numbered the houses of Jerusalem and the houses have you broken down to fortify the wall. Now here down below on this side you can see the remains of the houses right below us that were broken down, the stones taken and put in the wall. What happened here then? King has guys said I'm the king I must look after this great population that came that's fled from the Syrian invasion they come to live here on the western hill, or that part there. And I got to protect them. Bring me a map of Jerusalem. Got the pencil out. I want the wall right here. Said his, his architects, his, his builders, his company. There are people living there. Never mind. Break down the houses of the people to build the wall. And therefore, it says uh, further on, he makes also a ditch between the two walls for the walls of the altar. But you have not looked unto the maker thereof, now that respect unto him that's fastened it long ago. As if Hezekiah put more trust in his city wall. I mean, Hezekiah is a wonderful king, but he was also on the learning curve. That's what he do, to protect all those people. But to dispossess people out of their houses to build a city wall, well, didn't make the prophets very happy. But this is our archaeological chapter talking about uh, the, the Gaion Spring. The bringing down of the water to the lower pool, the Siloam pool, and the numbering of the houses in order to build the wall. So here is the broad wall, named, called by that name in Nehemiah chapter 12. But this is the northern wall of the Western Hill settlement in the wake of the Assyrian invasion. So that is the, uh, the wall there, and you can see the ru ruins of the houses that were torn down and the bricks taken to build Hezekiah's wall, and that just sits right in the middle of the city, and that's the passage where it says, it was actually Isaiah 22, verses 8 to 11, he didn't actually mention it when he was talking about it, but that's the, that's the section, basically, and the evidence of the siege that Hezekiah went and he rapidly built this wall to help fortify the city. But of course, he also bought, built the, the tunnel that we're, we're all familiar with, Hezekiah's tunnel, and uh, this is us going down deep into the, the ground. In 2 Chronicles 32, verse 30, the same Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of Gihon, brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David, and Hezekiah prospered in all his works, obviously because God was with him. But Sennacherib, of course, is coming against him. After these things, the establishment thereof, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 1, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered into Judah, camped against it, the fenced cities, and, and Hezekiah sees him uh, coming, and with the purpose of fighting against Jerusalem, of course it wasn't Sennacherib himself, but the people that he sent, 
He took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains that were without the city. And they did help him, so they gathered much people together and stopped all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land, saying, Why should the king of Assyria come and find much water? And of course, it's an absolutely amazing feat that they did. They dug this tunnel and they started at two ends. One group of men from here, one group of diggers from here, and they dug from the Siloam pool up one direction and from the Gihon spring in the other direction. And the, the whole um, tunnel itself is 533 meters, which is 1,750 feet long. It has a 0.6% drop, um, so it's about a foot over this period. Uh, two teams digging, and um, they dug about 100 or so feet underground, and they still, to this day, can't figure out how they did it. How did they start at two different sides and end up in the same place? They just can't figure that part of it out. But this is what it looks like under the ground. Um, Sister Charlene and I, fortunately enough, we were told by uh, some of the Billingtons who had been, you know, make sure you bring one of those headlamps. So we had a headlamp and everybody laughed at us and said, you know, you guys look ridiculous. Um, but then they were selling little candles and like, you know, it's windy down there. The wind blows through this so people's candles will go out and then it's pitch black. You literally, you're a hundred feet, it's like being down a mine. You cannot see your hand in front of your face. It's so dark down there. So it's uh, 160 feet at some points, or the middle is 160 feet underground. And um, they met, and I think they were about six or eight inches out when they came together. They had to just readjust the channel, coming underground. So this is what it looks like um, down <coughs> way underneath. And you can see the, the chisel marks here on the wall where the builders from Hezekiah's uh, time um, would dig and basically chisel this whole thing out. And the water's running down below, still running today. Um, in fact, we asked Brother Lane, well, should we wear shorts? He said, nah, just wear your trousers because by the time you're out of there, 15 minutes, this is Jerusalem, you'll be bone dry. And it was absolutely right. So we walked through this whole area here and um, it was pretty good. I had Brother Josh in front of me, so he was a ways ahead of me and I'm a little claustrophobic. And as long as the people behind me stayed in the back, I was okay with the whole thing. But it's a pretty neat um, thing to think that this is built by Hezekiah's men 2,600 years ago. And the inscription, which was stolen by the Turks, but they have a replica of it there, reads this. The tunneling, and this was how the tunneling was completed, as the stone cutters wielded their picks, each crew towards another. While there were still three cubits to go, the voices of the men calling each other could be heard since there was an increase in sound on the right and left. The day the breach was made, the stone cutters hacked toward each other, pick against pick. The water flowed from the source of the pool, 1,200 cubits, even through the height of the rock above the heads of the stone cutters uh, was about 100 cubits. So this is where they are underground, and they knew how deep down they were, and it all comes out in the pool of Siloam, which is the exit point, which of course figures heavily into the scriptures. And um, these are the stones he was talking about that King Herod had built, uh, where the water comes out, the step stones where the water is collected, and they could come and they could get their water. Of course, the city was much bigger. Um, this would give water to one part of it, but there's also water collection places. I mean, I know you're swimming through us out there, a lot of people get those jugs of water. Well, it was no different in Jerusalem back then. And these are the jugs of water. Um, this would be a water distribution center. So you would bring your jug, and the water would be dispensed from here, the water pots that we read about in the Bible, and uh, they come up, of course, in John chapter 2 and verse 6, the stone water pots. Remember the wedding of Cana in Galilee? There were six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Well, they've dug these up. These are those same stone water pots. They stand about that high. And they would have had the water in them. It takes two people to lift them with these, these handles on the side. And uh, this was the distribution center. But in Hezekiah's siege, as the people come against the city, of course, there's a man named Rabshakeh. Now, this is uh, an Assyrian, uh, the dress of an Assyrian. Again, uh, this is what it would have looked like. This is how he would have been dressed. I'm not saying this is Rabshakeh, but this is what it would have looked like. Isaiah chapter 36, verse 1, it came to pass in the 14th year of Hezekiah that Sennacherib sends these people against it. The king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem to the king of Hezekiah with a great army. 
And he stood by the conduit of the upper pole in the highway of the fuller's field and said, Say ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Syria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? And that's really the question for us. What is the confidence that we trust in in our lives today? And you really have to think about this. The, the Sennacherib inscription, this is in the British Museum. The great winged bulls that are there. Um, you would come up to just about the bottom of the, the tummy here if you were standing beside it. And you're six foot tall, that's how big these things are. And again, the inscription is right here between the legs. This is a, a photo of it. And it says, Hezekiah, king of Judah, did not submit to my yoke. Forty-six of his cities... Strong fortresses and cities of their territory, which without number I besieged, I captured, I plundered, and I counted as spoil. Hezekiah or himself I made like a caged bird in the midst of Jerusalem. And so he was kept. And of course, he doesn't say that he won because we know that he didn't. But in the end, of course, Hezekiah may have built this tunnel and all these walls. What was his confidence in the end? Well, it's given to us in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. Because if you remember the story of Hezekiah, um, while this is all going on, he gets sick. Now, the way it reads, you think that that happened after the siege. It actually happened right in the middle of the siege. So Hezekiah's made all this preparation. He's dug tunnels. He's built walls and shields and swords and all this kind of stuff. And in the middle of all that, Isaiah comes to him and says, put your house in order to Hezekiah, you're going to die. So all the confidence that he could have had in everything dissipates. And of course, we know the story, how Hezekiah turns around and he begs to God, he begs to God to, to spare his life. And the story again of the sundial going back 10 degrees. Remember what the Lord says, so they're not 12 hours in a day. So if it went back 10 degrees, each degree being an hour, if it was 5 o'clock in the afternoon, it's now 7 o'clock in the morning. And so it would have sort of started that whole day over again. And that was the sign to Hezekiah, one of the signs that he would be healed. The other sign was, I will give the king of Assyria into your hand. So when you read that, you then realize it didn't happen after the fact. It happened during the siege. And again, Hezekiah, you have to put your trust and your confidence in God. It's only through him that you can overcome. And brothers and sisters, it's the same thing for us. We have to put our trust and our confidence in God. Just keep your finger in Chronicles if you've turned there already. And just come to Philippians. Because this is really what it's all about for us. Remember as a young man, I used to read what Paul said about, you know, I fought the good fight, I've kept the faith. Uh, henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me in that day. Not me only, but all those who love his appearance. And never thinking, wait a minute. This is the same guy who wrote, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin. So how could the Apostle Paul prejudge himself and say, I'm going to be in the kingdom? How did he do that? And it used to bother me for years and years. Philippians 1 verse 6 is the answer. Paul writes, being confident of this very thing. He which has begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. His confidence wasn't in himself. He believed with all his heart that God had begun a good work in him and his confidence was that God could finish it. And that, brothers and sisters, has to be our confidence in young people, is that God has begun a work in every single one of us. We've been brought into contact with the truth. And sometimes we might feel that we're not up to it. How did Hezekiah feel? Are you going to beat the Assyrians when you're going to die yourself? Who's going to look after all these people? He was absolutely reduced to the point that the only thing he could do is put his confidence in his God. And that's exactly what he does. And then God heals him and we read about what he then does. He gets all the people together. He rallies them together. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 6 he says... And he quotes right back to Joshua and to Moses, Be strong and courageous, be not afraid, nor dismayed for the king of Assyria. For all the multitude that is with him, um, there's more, he says, with us than with them. With him is the arm of flesh. But Yahweh, our God, is, is with us to help us and to fight our battles. 
And the people rested themselves in the words of Hezekiah from Judah. Hezekiah is picking up here on A, Joshua and Moses, be strong and of good courage, but he's also picking up on Elisha. Remember Elisha and his servant went to Dothan? And when they were in Dothan, the whole city was encompassed by the king of Syria. And the young man wakes up in the morning and he looks out the window and there's armies everywhere. And he says, alas, my master, how shall we do? And Elisha turns around and says to him, fear not. Those that are with us are more than those that are with them. And he prays to God and says, I pray you, open the eyes of the young man that he may see. And God opens his eyes and he sees. And the whole mountain is surrounded by chariots of fire. Well, do you think Elisha had special angelic vision glasses on that he could see the angels? He couldn't see the angels, but he believed that they were there. Because God had said, the angel of the Lord encamps around them that fear him. And so he 100% knew that they were there. And young people, brothers and sisters, our God is the same God of the Old Testament as he is of the New. The same God of Joshua, the same God of Elisha, the same God of Hezekiah. So we can rest ourselves in those same words. For those that are with us are more than those that be with them. And so it is, of course, that that night, we have the saying, God plus one equals a majority. Because Isaiah 37, verse 36, then the angel of the Lord, it's singular, one. One angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians and hundred and four score and five thousand. And I used to love this when we read it. When they awoke in the morning, they were all dead corpses. And I used to think, well, how could they wake up and be dead? Like, if you're dead, then you're not waking up. Of course, it means the people in Jerusalem, when they woke up, and they looked at the window, 185,000 Assyrians are dead. Similar to the day of Armageddon, when they're going to be burying these people for months. That's the situation. That's our God. That's in who we have to put our trust. So Sennacherib returns back to Assyria, and of course he's worshipping his god in the house of Nishroch, his god, and Adramalak and Shereza, his son, smite him with the sword, and his son Esarhaddon rules in his stead. And this is Esarhaddon. Again, these Bible characters are true. Hezekiah, of course, would... Uh, write to, um, or receive letters from um, the king of Babylon, and Merodach Baladan would come and visit. And there's Merodach Baladan, of course, the guy with the big hat, um, and the cone on his head is the one that would come. And eventually, of course, this would lead to the destruction of Judah um, and of, uh, by Nebuchadnezzar in Jeremiah's day. I just want to play you this one little piece of video because, again, this, this actually relates more to our exhortation. Because we're now talking about the time of Jeremiah. We've moved on from Hezekiah, the time of Jeremiah. And remember, Jeremiah was put into the mire. He was put into a cistern wherein there was no water. But what they've just found in Jerusalem is exactly that. A new treasure has been discovered at the Davidson Archaeological Park in Jerusalem's Old City. At the foot of Robinson's Arch on the southwestern wall that surrounded the ancient Second Temple, steel bars guard the entrance to an even older find. Archaeologist Eli Shukran, the site director from the Israeli Antiquities Authority, took us deep underground to see what his team stumbled upon while digging for other things. Fifteen meters down, we walk through what archaeologists believe is an ancient Herodian tunnel. Shukran stopped at a hole and began to climb down a ladder. It led to this enormous ancient water reservoir. It can hold more than 66,000 gallons of water, or 250 cubic meters. The reservoir's plaster and the design suggest it could be 3,000 years old. More than 100 years excavation in Jerusalem. This is the first time that we found water system like that in Jerusalem in that time, in the time of the first temple period. Archaeologists believe this reservoir was a public one used during what the Bible describes as King Solomon's temple. It was built in 986 before the Common Era and destroyed in 586 BCE by the Babylonians. Finding artifacts from that time period is extremely rare. So there it is, the cistern under the ground. And we'll look at this in our excitation. Because here we have Jeremiah being cast into a dungeon 
the dungeon of Malchiah, the son of Hamalak, that was in the court of the prison. They let down Jeremiah with cords in the dungeon. There was no water but mire, just mud that was all left in it, in this, this cistern. And uh, Jeremiah sunk into the mire. And it took ebed Melech 30 men to come and to drag him out by putting old cloth rags under his armpits because he was stuck in that mud. So this was the siege that would take place. And we'll look at that later on. Of course, the Babylonians came in Nineveh. This is the Lion um, of Babylon. It's there in the Chicago Institute Museum as well. The little sign that says, don't touch it. I said to Shafin, you've just got to put your hand on it, just for a second. Because you're now in contact with the prophet Daniel. You're now in contact with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. This is the reality of the Bible. It's real. These people, these places all existed. There's a stone there in this little museum that actually has Nebuchadnezzar's name right on it. Right on one of the walls from Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's name written on this stone. But when they destroyed Jerusalem later on, brothers and sisters and young people, there's evidence of that description or that destruction. One last little piece and then we'll, we'll have to end because we run out of time. But here is the city. We were looking at this earlier on. This is the place where they found these, what they call, bule. But they made one major discovery when they dug here right, right down below. Because here was this house. They used to... The, the, Byzantine, the Jebusite remains for uh, terrace walls, but then down below here was just a floor, the only thing they could find, uh, of another house down below. And in that corner they found 50, was it one or 54 boule. Um, uh, a scribe writes a scroll. Uh, made one piece of letter, rolls it up, put a string around it with a knot, and takes a bit of clay, put it over the knot, and he had a <coughs> ring. And on his ring, his name was written in reverse. He would then press it on that little blob of clay, so you know, well, that's the one, who, that's the scribe who wrote it. There were about 50 scrolls piled up in the corner here. Nebuchadnezzar came, the whole city was destroyed by fire, Gone was the scroll, gone was the string. But what does fire do to clay? Hardens it, hardens it. it hardens it. They found 54 of those little clay bullies oh. in the corner there. If you look at the back of them, you can see the imprint of the knot of the string. But you could read all those names. And here's a picture of one of them here. This one here, which says, Gamaria, the son of Shafan. Read Jeremiah 36. Yes, there was a scribe, Gamaria, the son of Shaphan. We read about um, Baal, the scribe, in the time of Josiah. And now I worked for, for different professors, Benjamin Mazar, famous professors, and Nachman Avigad, I was working for him then. He's kind of a dry old professor, doesn't get excited much about anything. He got tears in his eyes when he had this little bullet in his hand. He said, here I've got contact there's a man whose name is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And that is just absolutely wonderful. And I found 50 of them. There are quite a few names of the Bible have been recorded. That names have been found here in, in a little piece of clay. Mm -hmm. Very insignificant, but most significant yeah. because here is a name. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So go to Jeremiah 36 mm -hmm. and you can read about it. Now that is just fantastic. And that is worth all the hard work, the digging here down below, sweating, getting dirty and all that. But to find something like that, you know you've been part of the enterprise, is absolutely fantastic. And they found more of those little gems all through Jerusalem. So there is the, uh, the burnt house, and there is the actual boule with Gemariah, the son of Shaphan on it. And uh, again, contact with that time period as he talks about. For our exhortation, when we're looking at Jeremiah, two of his enemies, their bule, were also found. Jucal, the son of Shelemiah, and Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, the very men who wanted Jeremiah put to death. These men, the bule, were also found in the exact same place. And so, brothers and sisters, as we think of Jerusalem, the city of God, what we've got to remember is this. It's just one little psalm. Psalm 102, verse 13, where we read, Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion, for the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. 
Thy servants take pleasure in her stones, and the favor the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of Yahweh, and the kings of the earth her glory, or thy glory. When Yahweh will build up Zion, he will appear in his glory. We've been looking at the evidence of the city that was destroyed so many years ago. And today, it's been built up once again. And the message to us is, when that happens, that's when the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to take place.